Thank you. Good evening. Congratulations to all of you. It's such an honor to have been asked to address you, um, all of you, in the company of these brilliant writers. And I've really welcomed this opportunity to think through a subject I've examined in poems, essays, even a memoir, several times at this point in my writing life, why I write. I'm reminded of something that I heard the poet Charles Wright say nearly a decade ago. I was sitting with him in the Library of Congress when he asked if he had any more books in him. He thought for a moment, then said, I've been writing for over 50 years from my same obsessions, and in the 26 or so books I've published, I've found about six or seven different ways to do it. I like the thought of that, a lifetime of writing from one's same obsessions. It suggests to me both the necessity of the act of writing, but also the possibility of the ongoing pleasure of discovery in it. The title of my meditation tonight is Crossroads, Native Pastures. And I want to begin with an epigraph, a few lines from a poem by Robert Duncan. Often I am permitted to return to a meadow as if it were a given property of the mind, that certain bounds hold against chaos, that is a place of first permission, everlasting omen, of what is. One, the world book. The first collection of books I ever encountered filled the shelves of the tall bookcase in the den of my grandmother's house. It stood just inside the doorway at the end of a long hallway at the back of the house. From floor to ceiling, there was an assortment of novels and plays, history, philosophy, and mythology from my parents' university years, a set of classic children's stories in several volumes, etiquette books, a group of pamphlets from the 50s about the proper dress and comportment of young ladies, an abridged dictionary, and the 26-volume encyclopedia, The World Book, 1966. Bought for the year I was born, the set was meant to be commemorative, marking the beginning of my journey toward knowledge. I was enthralled with the title, the idea that a set of books could contain even a single year of the world beyond our house. The thought of what awaited me in those pages, and in the pages of all the books on those shelves, ignited a longing that followed me even into sleep as I listened to my father's voice reciting a bedtime story the myth of Odysseus and the Cyclops that I knew he'd found there. I carry with me still a dream of that time, the earliest I can remember from my childhood. I am standing in the hall outside the room I share with my parents, my crib beneath the window next to their bed. It is night and the house is so quiet it seems that I am alone or that everyone else is sleeping. The long hallway before me is a cave tunneling through the darkness, the bookcase, I can just make it out at its opposite end. And there, standing in the doorway blocking my access, is a figure the shape of a man, made entirely of the crushed oyster shells, white and sharp-edged, that form the driveway beside our house. It's a familiar story, archetypal in its imagery, which is why I think it has stayed with me. I must have been only three years old when I had the dream, and so the contents of all those books were as yet unavailable to me. Why had I wanted them so much then? It's a question I've tried to answer over and over, because the imagery of dreams is figurative, metaphorical as all language is. It's easy to apply meaning over the course of one's life, to make sense of not only the past, but also the present, as now, this moment in which I try to follow a trail backwards to the origins of why I write. Two, Crossroads. For a few years when I was very young, my parents and I lived with my maternal grandmother in her shotgun house on a small plot of land just outside the city limits of my hometown, Gulfport, Mississippi. It was the house where my mother had waited out the long months of her pregnancy, the first house I entered when I left the hospital the day after I was born. 
The land on which it stood had been in my family for over half a century, since the area of town once called Griswold Community had been a settlement of former slaves after the Civil War. A hundred years later, though it had changed a great deal, the area still maintained a measure of its rural character. I remember waking up to the sounds of a rooster crowing, someone's hogs loosed and roaming, rooting in the dirt beneath the house. Sometimes I'd hear my grandmother outside, the trill of her laughter as she chatted in the yard with Uncle Munn, a man deaf from birth who spoke only in percussive syllables, choked and guttural. Down the street, a single skinny cow grazed in a tiny yard behind a chain-link fence. I could hear it lowing. In the decades of the early 20th century, when my grandmother was growing up there with her six siblings, the land and the house on it had abutted a pasture. The pasture had been there during my mother's childhood, too. She remembered calling across it to my great uncle and aunt on the other side, or treading a path through it to their house. In faded black and white photographs of the house from the early 1950s, I can see a fringe of field nearly out of the frame, as on the edge of consciousness, my mind, imagination, filling in the rest. By the time I was born, the pasture was gone, paved over to make way for new Highway 49, and the house now stood at a crossroads, the intersection of 49, a legendary highway of the blues, and Jefferson Street. There, in North Gulfport, on either side of the highway, the streets that ran east and west were named for states, the north-south streets for presidents. On every corner, four-foot-tall concrete pillars, sunk deep in the ground and painted white, bore their names, like monuments to the founding of the nation, the complex ideals embedded therein. It was one of the myriad ways the landscape of my native geography was inscribed with one version of America while simultaneously subsuming or erasing others. The marker representing Thomas Jefferson was directly in front of my grandmother's property at the edge of the shell driveway, a few steps from her mailbox, the fading letters of her name, a faint impression bleached in the sun. If the marker gestured toward the idea of the classical, my grandmother's house at the crossroads was the embodiment of a vernacular tradition. A double shotgun, the house was divided by a long hallway that ran the length of it, ending at the kitchen in the back, the living spaces on the left side, the work-related rooms on the right. Before my grandmother added on to it, the house had been a single shotgun characterized by rooms which are directly connected without hallways, one room opening into the next. Long, like the barrel of a shotgun, my father said. You can fire a bullet straight through it, front to back. The long hallway she'd added to the other half of the house had no windows. On one side of it, doors opened into the bedrooms. On the other side was an unbroken expanse of wall upon which my grandmother practiced her vernacular art. At the fabric store, she bought bolts of cloth printed with natural scenes, views of distant mountains, close-up images of owls on snow-covered boughs, and attached them to sheets of plywood the size of large windows. She added oil paint to some areas to give texture. To make the scenes lifelike, she affixed pine cones and branches with glue. The effect was a gallery of picture windows, scenes she might have dreamed of seeing outside her own. I understood it even then as a desire to make something beautiful of that hallway, to transform it, and I understood the act of imagination it took to look not simply at the pictures, but through them, into a world we'd made that was different from the actual world we inhabited. It's significant to me now that the house itself represented a vernacular tradition, as if it were something I could internalize by osmosis. Though the origin of the shotgun name is contested, scholars assert that the longhouse format is a legacy of West African architecture, brought to America by both free and enslaved peoples who arrived in New Orleans from Haiti after the Revolution in 1804 that it was situated at the meeting place of Jefferson Street and Highway 49 is also symbolic. In 
indicative of the journey toward what would become my abiding concerns. Big Joe Williams had inscribed Highway 49 into the lexicon of the blues with his 1935 song of the same name. Emblematic in blues mythology, 49 was part of the crossroads where, in an apocryphal story, the legendary guitarist Robert Johnson was said to have sold his soul to the devil. The problem with the myth, though quaint, is that it undermines not only the genuine aptitude and creativity that Johnson possessed, but also his studied skill, a result of practice and the mastery of his craft. In more ways than one, in the shotgun house at the intersection of Jefferson and 49, the folk ways and idioms of the African-American vernacular tradition met the received knowledge of enlightenment thinking and colonial culture, the language of Jefferson. I'm gonna get up in the morning and hit Highway 49, Big Joe Williams saying, I've been looking for my woman. Lord, don't think she can be found. Among the blacks is misery enough, God knows, but no poetry, Jefferson wrote. Geography, wrote Ralph Ellison, is fate. Inevitably, individuals are shaped by the history and culture of inherited places. Applying Ellison's words to the happenstance of that intersection allows me to see my beginnings there as destiny but I know it's a kind of magical thinking to look back and assign meaning to a constellation of circumstances, my birth on the 100th anniversary of Confederate Memorial Day in a place like Mississippi, the product of an interracial marriage, my early habitation in a house at the crossroads. My need to make meaning from the geography of my past is not unlike the ancients looking to the sky at the assortment of stars and drawing connections between them the constellations they named inscribing a network of stories that gave order and meaning to their lives. That's one of the reasons I write. I've needed to create the narrative of my life, its abiding metaphors, so that my story would not be determined for me. There's a scene in Richard Wright's memoir, Black Boy, in which he is answering a question posed to him by a white woman from whom he is seeking employment. Well, I want to be a writer, he says. You'll never be a writer, she says. Who on earth put such ideas into your nigger head? Though the scene spoke to me as evidence of our shared experience as black Mississippians, decades apart, it was published the year my mother was born, that scene would come back to me years later for a different reason. But at first, I saw only a reflection of my own time and place, a deep south still mired in myth and steeped in metaphors rooted in a, a matrix of selective memory, willed amnesia, and racial determinism. At the centennial of the Civil War, major civil rights legislation had been enacted, the Civil Rights and Voting Rights Acts of 1964 and 65, advancing the march toward freedom for black Americans. It was a violent crossroads in Mississippi, a critical moment in which the laws were changing, but the iconic symbol of white supremacy and black oppression, the Confederate flag, would still be enlisted to send an emphatic message, emblematic of a place determined to maintain a collective narrative about its people and history. In the century following the war, the habits of mind rooted in white supremacy had had a long time to take hold and become even more deeply entrenched. Robert Penn Warren, writing at the Centennial, described the metaphors white Southerners had come to live by as the great alibi, locating the Confederacy's defeat as the moment the solid South was born, a city of the soul rendered guiltless in the white mind of the South by the forces of history. The South, he wrote, explains, condones, and transmutes everything. Even now, any common lyncher becomes a defender of the Southern tradition. Bloodlust rising from a matrix of boredom and resentful misery becomes a high sense of honor, and ignorance becomes divine revelation. Defeat turns into victory, defects into virtues, and the most painful and costly consequences of the great alibi are found, of course, in connection with race. Because the Solid South was a society based on the myths of innate 
racial difference, a hierarchy based on notions of supremacy. The language used to articulate that thinking was rooted in the unique experience of white Southerners. The role of metaphor is not only to describe the experience of reality, metaphor also shapes how we perceive reality. Thus, in the decades following the war, the South, in the white mind of the South, was deeply entrenched in the idea of a noble and romantic past. It was moonlight and magnolias, chivalry and paternalism. The blacks living within her borders, when they were good, were children to be guided, looked after, protected from their own folly, mules of the earth, darkies with the light of service in their hearts. When they stepped out of line, they were bad niggers from whom white women, carriers of the pure bloodline, needed to be protected. They were animals to be husbanded into a prison system modeled on the plantation system. On the monumental landscape and in textbooks, they were unstoried but for the stories told about them, misapprehensions that rendered them, in the mind of the South, passive recipients of white benevolence who never fought for their own freedom, even as nearly 200,000 fought for the Union in the Civil War. And when they were exceptional in the mind of the South, they were magical. You're pretty for a black girl, smart for a black girl, not like the rest of them. George Orwell wrote, who controls the past controls the future, who controls the present controls the past. During the last two decades of the 19th century and the first two of the 20th, the Daughters of the Confederacy set out to inscribe a dominant narrative on the landscape and in the minds of school children, indeed into the American imagination. By commissioning the writing of textbooks, the erecting of monuments, and the naming of roads, bridges, and other public works, they constructed a physical and psychic landscape that wrote black Americans out of the story despite their role in the Civil War in preserving the Union. The state flag of Mississippi, incorporating the Confederate battle flag in its canton, was a daily visual reminder of white Mississippians' allegiance to the state's slaveholding heritage and the war fought and lost to maintain it. Its message, a kind of synecdoche, the small part in the upper corner standing in for the whole, that Mississippi would not be inclusive of all her citizens except in the ongoing narrative of white dominion over black subjects. And it was a symbol indicative of the new ways the state would find to maintain the second-class status of black Americans. When I arrived at the house at the crossroads, the day after the 100th anniversary of Confederate Memorial Day, the flags flown to celebrate the holiday glorifying the lost cause and white supremacy still dotted the landscape alongside the state flag of Mississippi, waving an implicit message, know your place. Despite the passage of the Civil Rights Act, my parents' interracial marriage was still illegal in Mississippi and in as many as 20 other states in the nation, rendering me illegitimate in the eyes of the law, persona non grata. From the beginning, I was an outsider in my own homeland, and I would come to feel profoundly E.O. Wilson's words, Homo sapiens is the only species to suffer psychological exile. Perhaps that is the existential condition of all poets. The act of writing is a way to create a world in language, a dwelling place for the psyche wherein the chaos of the external world is transformed shaped into a made thing and ordered. It is an act of reclamation and resistance. Three, the house of being. Beside my desk, I keep several artifacts, photographs of me with my parents in the yard at the house on Jefferson Street, a set of hot combs and a calendar from my grandmother's first business, Lee's Beauty Salon. When my mother was a girl, the front room of the house had been the beauty parlor. The calendar shows a picture of her, six years old, her name beneath it. But for the rusted staples holding the tear-off months in place, the calendar is pristine, preserved in a frame against acid-free paper behind museum glass. No pages have been torn from it, stopping time 
at January 1952. On my wall, it's a type of memorial, the frame I placed it in, a monument, not only to my mother, but also to the place it represents. I can see now that this has always been one of my impulses, to remember, to make a container for the vanished past, the forgotten or erased. I could not have known that in the beginning, but all the circumstances around me were leading me there. By the time I arrived at the house, my grandmother was a drapery seamstress. She had long closed the doors of the beauty parlor and taken a job downtown at a drapery factory. The day I was born, she quit that job and opened her own drapery business so that she could look after me. Her large workroom now occupied the front of the house, every inch of it filled with notions, jars of buttons, bolts of ribbon, fringe and trim, spools of thread arranged by color and shade in shadow boxes along the walls, needles and bobbins, pins and hooks and eyes. In the center of the room, there was a great cutting table and three Singer sewing machines. Along the perimeter, a chiffre robe and cedar chest where she kept patterns for dressmaking. The space beneath the table was stacked with bolts of cloth, remnants in every color, texture, and pattern, her vast stores of material. Above it, the pristine surface on which she worked, white as a blank page. I spent countless hours in that workroom, watching my grandmother at her machines or the cutting table while my parents were at work. She designed all kinds of window treatments, cornices and swags and shades, and I loved the different words for them, as well as the words for various fabrics, stitches, pleat folds, and decorative notions. She'd hum while holding pins in her mouth, her foot working the pedal of the sewing machine, a rhythm in counterpoint. If I was in the next room, my playroom, I'd listen to the sound the machine made, knowing exactly when she was sewing a long straight line, how it sped up or slowed down, depending on the difficulty of joining several layers of fabric, or when she turned a corner before beginning another long line of stitches. In my playroom, there was a large toy box with two rows of shelves above it, with fabric and cardboard and trim, I'd create little interiors on one of the shelves, decorating each room and making up stories about the lives of the people who would inhabit them. The other shelf housed the books I'd made, each one held together with ribbon, the pages yet empty but for my name on the frontispiece. I held them in a kind of reverence, monumental objects waiting for what I would inscribe there. Why does it sting me now? that in the years to come, they remained that way, that I never returned to them, never wrote in them a thing. I can see now that early on, from watching her craftsmanship, I was learning something about the necessity for precision, how to look for loose or uneven stitches, the just articulation when the designs on pattern fabric, when pieced together, matched seamlessly to the eye. To create the seamless blending of form, she made precise measures and cuts so that no material was wasted, nothing was out of place, the patterns true, the result a thing of beauty. That translates to me now as a way to think about syntax, about order and chaos, how one writes is inseparable from why one does. Those days at my grandmother's house were a constant in my life, even after my parents' divorce. Though my mother and I had moved to Atlanta so that she could begin graduate school, I spent every summer back home in Mississippi just to be with my grandmother. When my mother remarried, my grandmother's house became a refuge, the three months of summer a respite. For the nine months of the school year, I lived in a household where I was a kind of outsider, isolated by my stepfather, a troubled Vietnam veteran who was jealous of my mother's previous marriage, and contemptuous of me. There were great silences in that house and a dark undercurrent of domestic violence I would come to discover from which my mother was determined to protect me. At my grandmother's house I could relax and I'd spend a good deal of my time in solitary reverie as the dreamy child does, exercising what my father would call my inner resources. I could sit down to read and lose myself, all without fear of the chronic tensions I'd left behind in Atlanta. 
an introduction to the world of knowledge lay open before me in the pages of a book. When I arrive at the memory of that time, I am led back to the summer I was nine years old, determined to read as many entries in the world book as I could, a way I thought to be worldly, to escape my own circumstances and imagine myself, instead, on the steps of the Parthenon, touring the ruins of history, or in Parliament, debating the important issues of the time. What led me to the entry for Races of Man? Perhaps I'd been looking for it. Until then, my knowledge about the perceptions of race, racial difference, and hierarchy was still anecdotal, not academic, gleaned mostly from my experience growing up in the Deep South in the late 60s and 70s, the way white people in Mississippi had often stared at me and my parents with disgust or contempt, the way my grandmother had not been permitted to try on hats at the department store as white women were, the words I'd heard aloud on the playground at school, or whispered at the movie theater, dime store, piggly wiggly, mongrel, half-breed, nigger lover. Words that said to me, you are an aberration, and your white father, loving your black mother, is degraded, worthy of a slur. What did I hope to find in the world book? At the top of the page, I read the words, basic types, caucasoid, mongoloid, negroid, followed by descriptions of hair texture, eye shape, color, what were supposed to be distinguishing racial characteristics that if you were white, the ratio of femur to tibia was different than if you were black. In one race, the authors asserted, the femur is longer, in the other, the tibia. In the illustrations, the Caucasoid type was represented by what seemed to be the head of a classical Roman statue. Even in black and white, he seemed carved from Parian marble, his head tilted as in contemplation. The others were rendered primitives, the image of the Negro almost photographic. A specimen, he seemed to look straight ahead as in the pictures I'd later see of enslaved people, their innermost thoughts held in secret behind a blank stare. I don't know how I understood the text back then. It's the collection of images that has stayed with me a taxonomy. Starting where the entry began, white was first at the top, black was last at the bottom. When the images varied from this hierarchy, white was centered as though it were the standard against which the others were measured. The interplay between image and word, Caucasoid, Mongoloid, Negroid, was telling me everything about the world I inhabited. I knew something was wrong, but I had not yet fully rejected it had not yet begun to resist the calcified manifestations of received knowledge, even as I was already on a journey towards self-knowledge, not only the knowledge based in experience, but also in the cultivation of the intellect. Still, in that moment, armed with the encyclopedia's combination of traits, the purported rubric for determining what I was, my place within the racial hierarchy represented in the visual language, I sneaked into my grandmother's workroom, found her tape measure, and held it against my leg. If encountering the daily onslaught of white supremacy in the symbolic language inscribed on the landscape of my native geography was a kind of psychic violation, so then was finding evidence of those ideas in the encyclopedia's pages. As a small child, I had only believed in what I imagined to be the sanctity of books, a higher plane of thought, wherein, across time and space, the greatest and most enduring ideas had been recorded. More and more, I would come to understand that it was not simply ignorance that I'd need to push back against, but also the stores of received knowledge, philosophy, history, science, that I would encounter in the most learned places. 4. Native Pastures Despite the highway running right beside the yard, my grandmother's house seemed nestled within a small wood of mimosa, persimmon, and pecan trees. Bordered by a ditch that often overflowed after rain, the house sat two feet off the ground, perched on cinder blocks, seemingly unattached from the land, its tenuous footing just above the inevitable threat of water in a landscape frequented by hurricanes. <laughs> 
I remember one morning after a storm, opening the back door off the kitchen and seeing nothing but water where the backyard had been. The water had come up to the threshold and the house seemed to float there, on the verge of being swept away, out into the gulf. Standing in the doorway, I found my own reflection in place of the steps, and for a moment, I could imagine everything, our whole community, gone. It was the first inkling I had of being grounded in a particular place, tethered to it, despite the absence of a visible, solid foundation. Looking across the field of water was perhaps the first moment I began to register the nature of impermanence, that would translate into my need to inscribe our presence on the landscape, monumentally, in words, in order to hold on to what otherwise might be lost, what was already disappearing. When Henry James wrote to Edith Wharton, be tethered to native pastures, even if it reduces you to a backyard in New York, he was reminding her of the need to write from the places we come from, the places that have shaped us, our character, the folkways and idioms we inherit, our economic situation and our disposition toward it. I believe that he was also suggesting the need to remain tethered to the place of one's spiritual nourishment, not just the physical places from which we come, but that which is derived from the mind, the constitution of the intellect and the power of the imagination, rather than from experience. The first time I undertook this exercise, over a decade ago, I don't think I understood that part. It's taking trying to address this question I've answered many times in my writing life to see it now. There's a scene in my memoir, Memorial Drive, in which my early desire to write is placed in juxtaposition with my mother's life. It's called accounting. One day I come home from school giddy with news. It is early evening and the four of us take our seats at the kitchen table. Most days during the week I have practice after school and get home too late for these family dinners. Joel will have already left the house on those nights, so there are blessed stretches of days when I don't see him at all. Tonight, though, I'm too excited to save my news for when I can tell my mother alone, so I blurt it out as soon as we sit down. Not only have I been promoted to editor of the newspaper staff, but also because of a short story I wrote, I've been invited to join Quill and Scroll, the club responsible for putting out the high school literary journal. I can see the delight in my mother's face. She is smiling at me, and I am like a daffodil, lifting my face to the sun. I go on about how much I love the short story we are using in English class, how I like John Updike's A and P. The, the best so far, how I am planning to write a new story for an upcoming issue. I'm going to be a writer, I announce. You're not going to do any of that, my stepfather says, shrugging his shoulders. He doesn't even look up from his plate when he says it. My mother is seated to my right, and I see her out of the corner of my eye, a deep furrow between her brows, her jaw clenched so tight she seems to speak with her mouth closed. She will do whatever she wants. I am stunned, my head bent now toward my own plate, afraid to look at her or provoke him further by meeting his eyes across the table. For years, she has held her tongue, encouraging me mostly in private so as to avoid his jealous anger. This moment is different, and I know the cost. She's going to be beaten tonight for that, I think to myself. The tone, even inside my head, resigned, matter of fact. The rest of dinner we eat in silence, Joel glowering my mother in quiet defiance. I am stealing glances at her face, thinking of the bruises she'll wear tomorrow, all the hidden places on her body, soft with pain, calculating the price she'll keep paying to save me. I've replayed this scene in my head countless times. She will do whatever she wants. Even now, I hear in my mother's voice her measured restraint, the origins of my own. When I think of that scene, I'm reminded again of the moment in Black Boy when Richard Wright declares he wants to be a writer and what it means to have someone with a kind of dominion over you try to diminish you by telling you what you cannot do or be. It must have been around the same time that I read the book, 
Wright's hunger for the free and unfettered expression of the self in the midst of trauma both personal and national spoke to me deeply of my own experience. In only a few more years, my mother would be dead, stalked and shot to death by her then ex-husband from whom she had secured a divorce and managed for one glorious year to escape. In the weeks following her death, I turned to poetry, the only language that seemed capable of containing my immeasurable grief, as in these lines from Liesel Mueller's lovely poem, When I Am Asked, about why she began, in the aftermath of her mother's death, writing poetry. I placed my grief in the mouth of language, the only thing that would grieve with me. A few weeks after my mother's death, I wrote a single poem, and then I stopped writing. Perhaps I carried the guilt that somehow my early desire to write for the pleasure of it, because I loved the stories I was reading, because within the pages of a book I could escape to other worlds, leave behind the psychological abuse and constant threat of my stepfather, I had somehow created the situation in which she'd risk his violent retribution to protect that desire, to nurture it. Thinking I had been protecting her, I had remained silent about the many ways he tormented me. In the moment I stopped writing, I had also shuddered the articulation of my grief. It would be several years before the absolute need to articulate the depths of that trauma, the facts of it, and the way it connected in my psyche to the legacy of white supremacy, its ongoing manifestations, would lead me back to poetry, making it such that I had to write, lest the twin pulls of my existential wounds destroy me. Without writing the story of our lives, her tragic death, I was grieving in silence, re-inhabiting the violent silence of that household in Atlanta, a victim of my experience, not the master of it. To have dominion over oneself, to be the sovereign of the nation of the self, one must be the writer of the story. That I have come to be a writer in the aftermath of my mother's death still wounds me. She nurtured the very thing that would engender my survival in that house, despite what it meant for hers. Losing my mother hurt me into poetry. I write to answer her life with mine, to honor her memory by creating a monument in words. This is an early elegy from my first book. It's called Lyman, which is the physical threshold of a door, but also the threshold to an emotional or psychological state. It transports me to the backyard of my early childhood in Mississippi. Lyman. All day I've listened to the industry of a single woodpecker whirring the catalpa tree just outside my window. Hard at his task, his body is a hinge, a door knocker to the cluttered house of memory in which I can almost see my mother's face. She is there again beyond the tree, its slender pods and heart-shaped leaves hanging wet sheets on the line, each one a thin white screen between us. So insistent is this woodpecker, I'm sure he must be looking for something else, not simply the beetles and grubs inside, but some other gift the tree might hold. All day he's been at work, tireless, making the green hearts flutter. In the experience of writing the poem, I found that my mother could be resurrected in the sacred language of poetry, brought back in the imagination for a moment of recollection through the bittersweet pleasures of elegy. I have turned to literature for the way it enables us to momentarily suspend time, to live in the moment of a story unfolding or within the lyric articulation of the self wherein the intimate voice of a poem, the rhythms of thought, reanimate in the mind, both for the writer and the reader. In that act of reanimation, the language of poetry creates a space for what I've lost to carry on, a momentary stay against the inevitable. What surprises me is there is something I can see now that I had not al allowed myself to acknowledge, even in writing my memoir.
The longest chapter of the book is the first one, in which I spend a great deal of time describing my early life with my parents at my grandmother's house in Mississippi. It took me years to write it because I did not want to leave that time and place. To leave it meant leaving my native geography, the security I felt in that house at the crossroads for Atlanta. It also meant remembering the things I had spent most of my adult life trying to forget. It took me seven years to write the book, and in that time, I began to have a recurring dream that always takes place in my grandmother's house, always in the current moment. The dream begins in daylight, in my feeling of contentment at being back home, even though I am in the house alone. As night comes on, whatever relief I initially felt being back in that place of security, of unconditional love and happiness, goes away. Up and down the hallway, I walk from room to room, checking the windows, which I see now will not fasten. In the kitchen at the back of the house, the deadbolt will not engage, and I cannot get the door to fully clothe. Everything has only the appearance of being locked. Though I can't see anyone or anything outside, I am struck with the awareness that only my own vigilance will keep the house secure from whatever awaits. Each time I awaken from this dream, I was deeply troubled by the way it turns to nightmare, that the feeling of being so vulnerable, so unsafe from external forces, occurs inside the house of my happy early childhood, the place of refu refuge and respite in which I was able to dwell for three glorious months every year. Despite everything that has happened, the dream never takes place in Atlanta. But of course the dreams, the language of dreams, is not literal. Only when I think of my grandmother's house as a figurative place can I see what the dream has been telling me, that there are always existential threats. Living with grief and survivor's guilt, and in the aftermath of trauma, both personal and national, the potential for what might lie in wait, ready to reemerge, is imminent. Writing is a way to create order out of chaos, to take charge of one's own story, to be the sovereign of the self by pushing back against received knowledge and guarding the sanctity of the dwelling place of the imagination that place of first permission. I return often to the shotgun house at the crossroads of Jefferson and 49, the highway that was once a pasture. Though the house no longer stands, its contours are etched deep in my psyche, and I find myself opening again and again the doors to its perfect rooms, the myriad chambers of memory, one room leading into the next, the very architecture of thought. Thank you.